Well, welcome. Today we're starting the first lesson on Judaism decoded. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the um, the history of Jewish learning, really. That's what we're going to be talking about. And there'll be a lot of questions coming up. Some of the questions uh, will be covered in this class, but some of the questions are going to be uh, covered as we go further on. So some of those questions will kind of postpone to another time, but we will cover a lot of that. If you have your textbooks, let's go ahead and open up to student page number two. And one of the interesting things is that we talk about like where do where do all the the, the pieces of Judaism come from, right? So if we were to example, let's talk about Yom Kippur, uh, the holiest day of the Jewish year, Yom Kippur. There's a lot of different things that we do on Yom Kippur, a lot of different prayers we do on Yom Kippur. Um, what's first comes to mind when you think of Yom Kippur customs? Fasting. Bob, you were on mute, so I I didn't hear you. Ooh. Fasting. Yes. Sir. Yep. Fasting. What else comes to mind? Andrew, you're on mute. Andrea, you were on mute. I didn't hear you. Oh, I didn't say anything, actually. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought you... <laughs> well, I'll say a very long service. <laughs> long service, right? Lots long of prayers. service, yeah. Yom Kippur has five Shemona Esrei, five standing prayers. Uh, yeah. Shabbos and Yom Tov has four. The rest every day is three. Only day of the year, Yom Kippur has five. The extra of yes. New Elo. So what, but the first thing that was mentioned was, was the idea of fasting, right? So where is the reference for fasting on Yom Kippur? Where does that idea come from? So let's look at text number one. Text number one is straight out of Leviticus. It shall be on the, an eternal statute for you in the seventh month, which is Tishrei. We count the months from Passover. Passover is the first of our months. Tishrei begins Rosh Hashanah as the beginning of our year. I know that sounds strange. Um, most, most every every other culture, you've got the you know the beginning of the new year is the beginning of your months. We don't do that. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the new year, which is timed from creation. So Rosh Hashanah is from the timing of when God created the universe and we have creation. But the Jewish people, as an entity, begins with Passover. So when we count the months, we count from Passover, the month of Nisan. So the seventh month now is Tishrei, which is also when we have Rosh Hashanah. So it says in the seventh month, on the tenth day of that month, you shall afflict yourself and you shall do no work, neither the native nor the prophet who dwells amongst you. So we see here that the, the Hebrew word here is ayin nun hey onna and we see let's look at figure number one one on page three where does this word come from what's the root of this word so the the, the shorish of a hebrew word typically is three letters the three letters that are the root of this word is ayin nun hey we see the verse <coughs> we're trying to see what does the word mean where else is it used how do we know what it actually means right so when we talk about in Genesis, it says about uh, God spoke to Abraham and he said, you shall surely know that your seed will be strangers in a land that's not theirs and they will be, in, they will enslave them and be inu them, oppress them for 400 years. So that's the context of Abraham, God speaking to Abraham, right? Another example from the book of Genesis, 16 verses later, Lavan is speaking to his son-in-law, Jacob, about who's running away with uh, his wives now. And the loved one says, if you, the Anu, my daughters, if you afflict my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one was with us, God is between, witness between you and I. So again, the word, <coughs> the Anu, the same root word, meaning aff affliction here. <clears throat> in Genesis later on, where we have the story of Shem, who rapes D Yaakov's daughter Dina, uh, Yaakov and Leah's daughter Dina. So the verse in Chumash there says that Shem, the son of Chamor, 
Chivi, the prince of the land. He saw her, he took her, he lay with her, and v'yaneha, and he had violated her. If we go on to Exodus, when we talk about uh, the depression of the, of the people, the, it says that when God is saying that, and the Torah is telling us how, what not to do, <clears throat> you shall not tianun any widow or orphan, tianun, oppress. So you see all these different examples of the word anu, ana, and what it means, right? But in none of these examples does it say fasting. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to our first text and you ask the question <clears throat> about where do we get this idea of fasting from, and we use this quote from Leviticus, then it says you shall afflict yourselves or oppress yourself or so what does that what does that word mean and how do you come up with the idea of fasting that's still going to start with that question we're not going to answer it yet we're going to start with this this, this question here oh. and what we're going to play, talk about tonight is the oral torah the oral traditions that were passed down and for two thousand years already we've had arguments about how valid is the oral law anyway? And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Let's look at text number two, right? Here in the Gemara, in the Talmud, in Gemara Shabbos, uh, page 31, the first side A. So the text here says, the Lananju once came to Shammai and he asked, and he asked how many Torahs do you have? And Shammai replied, well, there's two. There's a written Torah and there's the oral Torah the oral explanation of what's in the written Torah. And the man says, regarding the written, I trust you, but regarding the oral Torah, I do not trust you. Convert me on the condition that you will teach me just the written Torah. So the question is like, what, what is going on? Why, why is he refuting the oral Torah? And on what basis is that? And we're not talking about somebody who's insincere. We're not talking about who's coming here, you know, just just uh, to harass. He's he's coming. He sincerely wants to learn, but he doesn't want to take on the oral Torah mm. because he has some sharp questions about that. Mm. So, what we want to talk about is what's what's the question here? What's the problem here? Let's look at page five. Here are some of the common questions that come up, right? Why is the Bible alone insufficient, the five books of Moses? Why do we have to, you know, could, what could be better than the written word of God? Who is the author of the oral Torah anyway? If it's a, if it's a work of ancient rabbis, it, is it really relevant to modern life? <laughs> Weren't their ideas shaped by the knowledge of the circumstances of their time and not, not current with our lives? How is it really relevant to us now? <laughs> so one of the questions. Bear with me just a second. I've been, uh, when I get on the, the class, I tend to cough because I'm speaking louder than necessary and have to work on that. So, isn't the oral Torah filled with debates? And if you have debates, then how do you know which side is the right one or not, right? And don't the debates in the oral, or, the oral Torah indicate that it's not divine? How, how can it be divine if, if there's arguments? And if it's men, men arguing, right? <clears throat> Maybe there's multiple opinions. How can it be a God-given system if there's multiple opinions? Do we have the original message? Is it possible the oral Torah has been passed down accurately for so many years? How is that possible? So these are some of the... <coughs> these are some of the questions we're going to be dealing with. Hang on just a second. Maybe while the rabbi's out, other people could speak. 
I, I think one of the things that the rabbi was mentioning about the people that um, don't seem to believe in the oral Torah, I, I seem to recall a few group names like Karaites and the uh, Samaritans. And there were several other groups that had partial conversions as groups, but they never accepted the oral Torah. I meant to say talk amongst yourselves while I'm gone, but that didn't happen. <laughs> I usually have my cough drops all here by the table, but I've been gone for six weeks, so I'm trying to re re <laughs> get everything coordinated. Actually, Yaakov filled the void and gave us a little lecture. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> us, yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so what we want to do in this today, well, one of the things we want to talk about but all the way through the, the course, really, we're going to be talking about the oral Torah. Where is it from? Why is it important? Why is it necessary? Why is it designed this way? You know, these are some of the questions we're going to be dealing with over the next few weeks. And how is it actually relevant? So let's go back to the question about Yom Kippur, right? If you ever fasted on Yom Kippur, we know about fasting because of the oral law, not the written law. You ever attended a bar or bat mitzvah? That comes from the oral law, not the written. Hanukkah candles, tradition that came through the oral law. If you ever attended a Passover Seder, a lot of the things that happen there, they're not in the Torah, they're in the written, they're the oral Torah, not the written Torah. And when, if you want to know anything about what the Torah has to say about human rights, about charity, about privacy, about counterterrorism, all of these things are things that are covered in the oral law not in the written. So the fact that it's a part of, of, of Judaism and a critical part of Judaism <clears throat> is, is absolutely essential. So, so what, what is the oral law? What is the oral Torah, right? So <clears throat> when we read about in the written Torah, when we read about Moses went up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, and he came back from Mount Sinai with the tablets. The Jewish people <laughs> were worshiping a golden calf. He broke the tablets, exacted judgment, went back up on Mount Sinai for another 40 days and 40 nights, begging for forgiveness and continuing the process, came back down, went right back up another 40 days and 40 nights. So there's three sets of 40 days and 40 nights that Moses was up on Mount Sinai one-on-one -on -one with God. <laughs> And it says, during that time, he was in a unique state. He did not eat. He did not sleep. It was 40, 40 days and 40 nights, one-on-one -on -one with God. What did he do? This is the, where the oral Torah comes from. Because on those times that Moses was up on Mount Sinai, one-on-one -on -one with God, God was explaining all of the things that go on in the written Torah, and what that means and how that plays itself out. And this was all delivered orally. So when we talk about the written Torah and the oral Torah are divine, divinely given, this is all from God. This is how it happened. And this is why we still say the whole thing is completely divine and part of God. Now, we'll have some more questions coming back on that. But... That's the origin. So <clears throat> it's interesting because there's actually a few halachas. There's only a few halachas, Jewish laws, that we refer to as a halacha l'moshim Sinai, a law from Moses on Mount Sinai. Rambam talks about those in his introduction. <clears throat> but didn't he give all of the commandments? <laughs> yes. Only a few laws are attributed as halacha l'moshim Sinai because these few are in a unique category that the written Torah does not contain or hint to these laws at all. For all the ones that you see in Torah, there's a hint to, well, obviously it's Moses from Mount Sinai. It's written in the written Torah, right? But there are some laws that were orally transmitted that are not even in the written Torah, and we still say that these are from Moses on Mount Sinai. 
So <clears throat> our class is going to be broken up. Today, we're going to talk about the derived, the received Torah. Lesson two, we're going to talk about the derived Torah. And then number three, we'll talk about, lesson three, we'll talk about legislated and customary. And then we'll go on. But tonight, we're going to focus on specifically the received Torah. So <laughs> let's look at text number four, page seven. And let's go back to the story. So this guy who wanted to convert, he went to Beis Shammai, and he asked Beis Shammai, <coughs> teach me the old Torah while I stand on one foot. You know, teach me only the written Torah. I don't accept the oral Torah. And he was shooed away. So what does he do? He goes to the other sage. He goes to Hillel. Now, Hillel was known to be a much more compassionate and patient guy. And so he basically says the same thing. He says to me, I want to... You know, I want to learn from the Torah, but only the written Torah, not the oral. And Hillel says, fine. So they start to study. What happens? Text number four. The first day that they started to learn, Hillel taught him, Aleph, base Gimel, Dalad. This is an Aleph. This is what it looks like. This is what it, the sound it makes. Here's what the base is. Here's the sound it makes. This is what it looks like. This is how it's printed. This is how it's written. And then that's the first day. The second day they come to learn, and he reverses it. He starts with the last four letters of the Aleph base and says, this is an Aleph. This, this is, he shows him a Toph, and he says, this is an Aleph. He tells him a Shin, this is a base. So he tells him, he completely reverses it, right? And the guy says, wait a minute. Yesterday, you didn't tell me to me this way. You said something completely different. And Hillel answered him, are you not relying on me to teach the written Torah? So rely on me to teach you the oral Torah as well. In other words, he caught the guy up in his own, in his yeah. own arguments. Basically saying, I taught it to you right the first day. I'm showing it to you a different way the second day. And you're saying, wait a minute, that's not true. Based on what? Based on what I told you yesterday? Oh, so you, you're relying on my teaching you. <laughs> and that is the oral Torah. So basically, <laughs> Hillel proved, in a sense, he, that it's impossible to have a written text without an oral tradition that explains what it means. Because essentially, I can call it an Aleph, and you can call it zet, a, a, a Zet. You can argue with me. But mm -hmm. you can't really argue if 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 you're if you're coming to me to learn from me, you're going to accept that I'm teaching you what I'm teaching you is going to be uh, what I understand and how I understand it, and you're coming to me for what that aspect of it. That's the oral tradition. Rabbi, yes, but to you, please. Several times now, you've talked about the written Torah, and then the oral Torah being the oral tradition. Is the oral Torah supposed to also be the word of God just carried forth orally rather than written? Exactly. If that's so, is it just because you chose the word tradition or did you deliberately want to call the oral Torah tradition? I, I, I use them to, uh, back and forth, oral Torah, oral tradition, uh, and, and we're going to break them down into different parts over the next three weeks. Uh, but they go, they go together. In a sense, <clears throat> we talk about the Talmud. Mm -hmm. But the Talmud has two parts to it. They came from two different generations. There's the Mishnah, but there's the Kamora that's the commentary on the Mishnah. But together, they're still called the Talmud. So we're still using those words interchangeably. <clears throat> there's an old joke about um, a Coca-Cola salesman and uh, he went to Israel and when he got to Israel so he did, he did a whole campaign in Israel um, but obviously the, you know that's a different language there and so he did he did a, a graphic presentation of the of the of the of you know of their sales program right so in the first picture, the fixed first picture, he's got 
a guy lying, a man lying in the hot desert sand, totally exhausted and close to fainting. <laughs> in the second picture, he's got a man drinking a Coca-Cola. And in the third picture, he's got a man totally refreshed and happy. And so the guy, his boss, he says, well, well, sounds like you did great. What's wrong? In Israel, they read from right to left. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. So that's, let's, now let's make this even harder. Let's make this even harder. All right. <clears throat> let's go to uh, page eight. If you got a writing implement, let's take a minute, do a little exercise. There's a B for Bravo, R for Romeo, D for Delta. I want you to write down as many words as you can think of in the next couple of minutes where you add a vowel, vowels only, between, before, or after the letters, but the B, R, D have to stay in the same order. So you can add... Uh, only alpha, you can only add vowels. You can add them before, in the middle, or after, but the BRD has to stay in the same order. Go for it. Take a minute. Write down as many numbers as you, names you can think of, words you can think of. <coughs> Do the consonants have to be separated by vowels? No. Can you have more than one vowel in between the consonants? Or do yep. more than one, only one? You can't, okay, good. There you go. Bob, you're on mute. So you could, for instance, have brood. B-R-O-O-D. Yep. You can have two. Okay. You could also have B-R-O-A-D. Right. And B-R-E-D. B-R-E-D. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for those helps. <laughs> Any more? <laughs> While they're doing that, I just wanted to let anybody know who cares. A new nuclear submarine is in the process of being constructed mm -hmm. and will be commissioned next year. Wow. It's relevant to this discussion only because it will be the USS Rickover. Oh, yeah, I've heard about the Rickover. It will be yeah. named for Admiral Rickover. Uh, it will be the second for him. Uh, he's a Chicagoan. Mm -hmm. He's also Jewish. There you go. Surprisingly enough, I knew that. <laughs> he was also a real SOB. Yeah. <laughs> it goes with the rank. <laughs> when he was... When he was forcibly retired by the Navy was in Reagan's administration, he went into Reagan's office and really chewed him out. He chewed Reagan, you know, Reagan Rick over chewed Reagan out. There you go. Charge out of the office. One of the few guys who ever did that. <laughs> Maybe the only guy. <laughs> I'm on the commissioning committee for the boat. And uh, in, in the course of that, we got a lot of communications from Navy personnel who had served with him. And all of the letters that we received were similar in that they all talked about what a terror he was, yeah. how yeah. insulting he was, and how terrified they were to be interviewed yeah. by him. Yeah. yeah, I served during that time, but I never served with him. But we had many stories about what he did to people. He once was on he was on a mess deck, uh, touring the mess decks, and and the man was sitting there, and he had a bowl of soup. Took his salt and salted his soup. And Rick Orb would chew him out for that. He said, Why did he chew him out? Just, did you taste the soup first? You didn't, you assumed it needed salt. <laughs> and he gave him a for that. So anything. Okay, back on yeah, task. <laughs> right. Okay, here we go. Sorry, never mind. Don't <laughs> sorry, man, Rick Orber. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> you do the exercise here okay. because the written Torah has no vowels. Uh -huh. The written Torah has no vowels. Yes, I don't know. Vowels, write. that word, that same three letters could mean many different things. Mm -hmm. um, I think the uh, in the book, the Bible unauthorized, they listed 
Bard, bared, bird, braid, broad, brood, board, bread, beard, buried, yeah. brad, bread, read, board, bride, aboard, abroad. So it, there's so many things it could be yeah. without the, the vowels. How do you know? <clears throat> so that's another challenge of the written Torah is that it doesn't have vowels. What about the challenge of the special punctuation? Yeah, now that's next time. Let's look at this next one. Look at text number five, page eight. The choice of the first fruits of your soil you shall bring to the house of God. You shall not cook a kid in its mother's chalav. Chalav. What does chalav mean? No. Chalav could mean milk, yeah. but it can also mean chalav, fat. Mm. So you could try and read from the context of a sentence to know what the word means. And modern Hebrew does that all the time. But in the Torah, in this particular case, it could mean either one. It could mean the milk or the fat. So yeah. how, how do you know? So we have to rely, we have to rely on the oral Torah because there are no nukudos, vowels, in the written Torah, there are places, multiple places, where even within context, it <clears> could <throat> mean multiple things. Mm. How do you know what it means? <laughs> so lack of vowels in the written Torah leaves certain passages very ambiguous, and it indicates very clearly that there can't, you cannot rely on the written text alone. Yeah. Can't be done. All right, let's look at page nine. Please check off one of the boxes. Now that you've checked off a box, I'd like a volunteer to raise a hand. My God, if you ever want to close your eyes when you're asleep again. Oh, okay. <laughs> exactly. I, I, my boss yeah, is here, so I'm, I, 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 I recuse myself. <laughs> <laughs> but Bob, you spoke up, so let me ask on you. Bob, would you read that sentence? Were, any sentence or the one I checked? No, the one, the, 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 the sentence we're starting from, the quote. Woman without her man is nothing. Okay. Now, Judy, could you read the same sentence? Woman without her man is nothing. So watch the phrasing. Let's put a, an exclamation mark, mark after woman. Yeah. Woman without her man, her man, is, is, man nothing. is nothing. Right. <laughs> woman, stop. Without her, man is nothing. Exactly. Right. So without punctuation, how do you know what that sentence says? It went two extremely opposite ways mm -hmm. yeah. without the punctuation. There's a delightful book out there that is about grammar and punctuation. It's called mm -hmm. Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. Yes. <laughs> it's great. Great and a great book for kids to read because it all of a sudden understands this Adult concept of punctuation. Adult <laughs> Absolutely, right? Yes. So the Torah has no punctuation. There's no exclamation point. There's no comma. There's no period. There is no, how do you know when a sentence begins and when it ends? And what it's so critical. We just saw how critical punctuation is. So how do, what, how do you have a whole Torah scroll and there's no punctuation? What does it mean? So <laughs> Ta'amim and trup are the are the ways we know. So exercise number three, page nine. On the menorah shall be four goblets decorated its knobs and its flowers. Well, okay, this is a directive on, on how to build a menorah, right? Mm -hmm. But like, were the goblets supposed to be decorated or were the knobs and flowers supposed to be decorated? 
You, yes. So we've seen the point of these past discussions and pieces is if you have just a written Torah, no vowels, no punctuation, no end of sentence, no beginning of sentence, how do you know what, what it's talking about? And, and it, it, without the, or, you're, the intention of the Torah is to give us a structure of what we should be doing. It's a, um, how we should fulfill our connection with God, how we stay attached to God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. How do you do it when you don't even, well, how does it mean? <laughs> if you don't have an oral tradition, the written Torah, <laughs> the five books of Momus, is completely incomprehensible yeah. <laughs> for multiple reasons, right? Text number, page number 10, text number six. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. This is the prayer we say twice a day in the morning and at night before going to bed. We say this prayer when we put on tefillin. Let's look at the words here. These words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children. Speak of them when you sit in the house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for tota face between your eyes. You shall inscribe them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. <laughs> what is tota fos? Now, earlier, when we had the word of afflicting, we talked about Yom Kippur. We looked at the examples in other places that that word is used in Torah, to mm -hmm. be able to tell us from the context of the play times it's used, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Totafos does not appear anywhere else in the entire five books of Moses. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Again, without the oral tradition, the oral mm -hmm. laws, we would have no idea <clears throat> that this refers to the black boxes with four compartments that are made with leather that have four parshas in them, and it becomes the tefillin. Yeah. It shall be for tota first between your eyes. And where yeah, is that's the, not the word? Translate Pardon? the word. What is what is the word tota fold in it's English? Is translated in <laughs> multiple reminders. ways. As reminders. As a reminder, or as frontlets, yeah. or as it has been translated into English as multiple different things. Yeah. But it means the black to fill in box. Yeah, yeah. But how do we know that's what it means? From the oral Torah only. Okay. Well, that's a good example because when I was used to put, I put on to fill on every day. And the translation I used to use always said for reminder, which means, well, you should remember it, you should envision it between, you know, in front of your eyes. But the one I use now says that it says they sh shall be tefillin between your eyes. It doesn't say remind. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be not like tefillin or ask. It should be tefillin. <laughs> and that's what the translation. So that's what I say now. <laughs> yeah, and I grew up with a, a translation that said uh, it shall be for frontlets between your eyes. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, right. That's what I grew up. With. I never knew what that meant. <laughs> yeah, that's almost that's, that's almost as indecipherable. Right. Doesn't Let's look somebody at call them phylacteries? I heard that then, too. Yeah, that, so phylacteries. That, what is that's, that? like a Greek, that's a Greek term, I think. Yeah. yeah. And it refers to, actually, it refers to the boxes, not the contents. It refers to, like, something that guards or protects something. So phylacteries actually refers to the boxes. I don't think the Greeks knew what was in there anyway. So <laughs> they say, oh, some boxes they put. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So text number seven. This is from the Kuzari, which is a book of Kabbalah. Mm. It's a book of Kabbalah written by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Yehuda Hanasi was a, a, a court physician, an author, a poet. Um, but he also wrote the Kuzari, which is a philosophical work. The Kuzari was written in the form of a discussion between a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim before the king of the Kuzars. And... And so in his written debate in this forum, this is one of the things he talks about here, was he said, he, he says, those who argue, 
the, the Catarites 200, 2000 years ago who argued, I only want the written Torah, I don't want the oral Torah. He basically goes through the things that we've been doing today and saying, how would you know? How would yeah. you know where to slaughter an animal without the oral Torah? How would you know whether you, which are the forbidden fats to eat from an animal sacrifice? How would you know when it says that, that a man should not, not go out of his place on Shabbos? What does that mean? His house, his, his community, his country, his state? What, what, what does that mean? Without the oral Torah, you would have no idea how to fulfill the Torah. And so the ambiguity that's there. So this is what he's saying in the Kuzari is it showing example after example. If you say you don't want the oral Torah, if without the oral Torah, you end up making up your own decision on what things mean. Yeah. So you're still going to do an oral tradition. It's the one you make up. And we've seen that before too, right? I have a question. Yeah. So for the written Torah, <clears throat> Um, the, it could be translated in many different forms, but to help us understand the written Torah, we have Ra a Rashi, who's written to break it down, to put it more in the terms of a fifth grader or so. On the oral, oral Torah, what do we have that, that is similar or do we not? Because you could you could say things and explain it, but you got to realize the the mind works in different ways. If I hear some, the same thing that you hear, I may not translate it the same. Right. Because so I, we're so we're going to see that the oral law goes through all of the different pieces of what the Chumash is talking about and explains it. But in another context, um, the Targum Onkelos was a translation that was done years ago. And oftentimes you refer, you'll see a, a, a Sefer Chumash, a book of, of the Torah, which will have the Targum Onkelos written, written with it, which mm -hmm. is an earlier translation that was done to the, mm -hmm. um, the Aramaic language. Oh. And so then oftentimes if you had a question, you say, okay, well, what does the Targum Onkelos tell, tell you? How did he translate it? And if you understand mm -hmm. how he translated it, that helps as well. But again, it's still going to go back to having a better understanding from the oral Torah. Page 13, <clears throat> text number eight. Again, this is straight from Deuteronomy, right? So the Torah says here, the mitzvah that I am prescribing you today is not too mysterious or remote from you. It's not in the heavens you should say, who shall go up to heaven and bring it to us so we can hear it and keep it. It's not over the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea and get it for us so we'll be able to hear it and keep it. It's not, it is something that's very close to you in your heart, in your mouth, and in your heart, that you may fulfill it. See today that I set before you a choice between life and good, and death and evil. Choose life so that you and your descendants will live. This is the Torah. This is direct quote from the Torah. And the Torah is telling us, choose between life and death, choose life. Choose to do the Torah and mitzvahs. Well, how can we do that if the written Torah is so ambiguous, doesn't have vowels, doesn't have punctuation, doesn't necessarily translate the words we're talking How do we do that? Obviously, there has to be an oral Torah that explains it. So even by just learning the written Torah, you have to understand that there's no way to do this without having an oral translation, an oral Torah, an oral explanation that comes with it it would be impossible to do so. So any con any context of being able to say, hey, I only want the written Torah is foolhardy. Mm -hmm. It shows a complete, not only shows contempt, but it also shows a total misunderstanding of what's written there. Because if you've learned enough written Torah, you know that you can't rely on written Torah alone. There's just too much, too much ambiguity. You need to have <coughs> translation that comes with it, explanation that comes with it. It's clearly written into the system that that's required. Text number nine on page 14. This is from Deuteronomy again, and it says, when God expands your borders as he promised you and your natural desire to eat meat asserts itself, so you say, I, want, I wish to eat meat, you may eat as much meat as you wish. 
<laughs> up, up until this time, <clears throat> people had a backyard bob, a bama, a backyard barbecue, right? <laughs> if you wanted to yeah. eat meat, you yeah. slaughtered the animal as a sacrifice to God. You offered part of that animal up to God on your backyard a barbecue, on your backyard um, bama uh, altar, on your backyard altar, and then you could eat the meat. <laughs> but once there was a mishkan, a tabernacle, a central location where we were, where, where God says, bring your sacrifices to me there. Well, does that mean if I don't have time to go to the tabernacle and bring the thing today, I can't have meat tonight? No, no, eat. If it's long as it's kosher and it's, it's kosher and it's slaughtered properly, you can eat meat. Bring the required sacrifices and that suffices for all the meat eating that you want to do. I like to make the comparison of tzedakah. Mm -hmm. you, you made $1,000 in income, you give tzedakah for that one, and it redeems the rest of the money. Go ahead and spend the way you want. <laughs> so you don't have to bring, you don't have to, every piece of meat you eat doesn't have to have a, be a sacrifice to God. <laughs> but it says you need only slaughter your cattle and your small animals that God will give to you in the manner that I have prescribed. It says, in the manner that I have prescribed, but nowhere in the written Torah is it prescribed how it's done. It's only in the oral Torah. So obviously, you have to have an oral Torah. So <coughs> this concludes our, our, our mm -hmm. uh, discussion about why there has to be an oral Torah. A written Torah by itself <coughs> cannot be understood. Too many reasons it couldn't be understood. And so with that completed, let's say, okay, I got it. You have to have an oral. You have to have an oral term, right? But why did God set it up this way? Mm -hmm. What People what's the story. benefit <laughs> of having an oral Torah that I couldn't have gotten by having it all written? So let's take a look at that, right? Let's look at page fifteen. <clears throat> We see in text number 10, this is again from the Talmud, Gemara Gitten. It says, you are not at liberty to speak the oral Torah from a text. You're not allowed to write it down. Okay, granted, in our perspective now, it has been written down. But when the time this was stated, it, you can't write it down. We'll come back to this later. But the idea is you can't write it down. It was not, Moshe was not allowed to write down the oral translations, to, to, uh, oral explanations, right? So. But this comes from the Talmud. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it comes from the Talmud explaining what happened back there. And this, so, is, this is, the Talmud is written by, is, is a man-derived whatever we call it the commentary yeah. right so okay so, so what we're saying and and that's what we're going to talk about now is how did we get here how did mm -hmm. we get here right mm -hmm. so understand that at moses's time he was not allowed to write it down this has to be transmitted orally right and so there we want to know we'll come back to that bob we'll get to it we want to know why did God choose that there has to be a system of oral transmission from the written text? What, what is the advantage to that? So we're going to list three advantages. We're going to list three advantages, right? Let's play with one first. Let's look at page 16. An advantage of an oral law. Okay, let's stay there. Let's look at the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia. Now, by the way, we're not uh. getting into a debate tonight. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, no, good, a good one. <laughs> we are not going there. All right. All right. Okay. What we're going to do is make a comparison mm -hmm. as to why we have to have an oral debate <laughs> from a written law. All right? The Second Amendment says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state 
The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. There's two ways to go with this. At least. At yes. Least. yes. Bob, I'll let you take it from here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Well, first of all, def define the militia. <laughs> one <laughs> side, <laughs> one side says that it's a state's right, not an individual right. It's a state's right to have a militia and to arm the militia. It's not an individual's right. It's a state right, and the state can decide how to implement this. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a state that says individuals can't have guns or they have to license guns or whatever, or they can only conceal carry, that's up to the state. But they the state has the right to have a militia. The other side of how you interpret that is, this is an individual's right to bear arms mm -hmm. and therefore defend their state. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be that the Supreme Court in 2008 decided the District, District of Columbia versus Heller, they sided with the idea that it's an individual right theory. What I want to talk about is not the guns. What I want to talk about is why did the framers of the, uh, of the um, Constitution, the, the amendments... They are two different people, two different sets of individuals. The Constitution, the Constitution does not contain this provision. That's true. Okay. This is an amendment of right. added later. Those, of rights. those who wrote the Second Amendment to the Constitution, why did they not clarify what this means? And miss all well, the Maybe fun. because they thought it was clear. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. <clears throat> In the context of the date and time that they wrote it, to them, this was not ambiguous. This was very clear. Later generations have to figure out, wait, wait a second. And then you get into the whole, you know, then it becomes an oral discussion and yeah. it has to be defined again, right? Oh, uh, yes. <clears throat> and and the, the advantage is that when you have something which is written, and it has an oral explanation that comes with it, that oral explanation goes into greater detail. We're going to come back to another benefit later, mm -hmm. but it goes into much greater detail than you would have in just a written form. Yeah. But the easier way, of course, is to just make it clear in the first place. Yeah. They thought it was very clear. Yeah. To them, it was clear. It was a little bit more complex and convoluted thinking than we are used to yeah. today. You know, the term, which of course, was different. Well, the term of well regulator can be subject to debate too. Back in those days, there weren't official bureaucracies that set these things up. It was guy, like the Minutemen in, in Reverend the go. Guys got, got their guns, they okay, ran out with their on, guns and got on, together. Hang on, we right, got the right. point. Right. Sticking <laughs> with the issue before us. That's what I'm saying. Definition system. Right. Let's look at page 17. <laughs> Exercise number four. I'm not going to ask anyone to volunteer to read this out loud, but just read this to yourself for a second. <laughs> this sounds yummy. <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell. <laughs> I like onions. Cookbook. What is this? The person who wrote this recipe in 15th century English cookbook thought this was very clear. And to that date and time, it probably was very clear. But over time, it wouldn't necessarily be so. Let's take another example. Text number 12. Before we read this text, before we read this text, I have a question for you. Let's go back to Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, Hashem O'Kein, Hashem Echad. We just had that in the Parsha. Literally just had that in the Parsha, right? This verse is first said, it's quoted in the Torah, it is first said on Jacob's deathbed. He looks at his 12 sons <laughs> and he says to himself, my grandfather has two sons, one kept the path. 
My father had two sons. One kept the path. I got 12 sons. What's going on for them? And they answered to him, listen, our father, Jacob, <laughs> the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. That's the first time Shema Yisrael is said and has become a foundation of our belief since then. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. What does it mean? Hero Israel, Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. What does the Lord is one? What does that mean? Are, is that rhetorical? No, nope, I'm asking. Go for it. <laughs> well, As well, opposed I know to polytheism, it, that's what it means. There is one. I am the Lord thy God. I shall have no other gods before me. Okay. Yeah. And that was a problem in Roman times because under Roman law, if you want to be a Roman citizen, you could worship whatever god you choose to worship as long as you accepted the Roman emperor as a god also. And if you didn't do that, then you were in trouble. They didn't care who else you worship. They just didn't want to, they want to make sure you worship the Roman, Roman emperor. And that was something that, that of course, the Jews, one is one. The one means now one god, now no emperor in vow. That's so it's interesting to note, uh -huh. Rabbi Yosef Al Albo, it's mm -hmm. interesting to note that he brings up here that um, Christians interpret this mm -hmm. verse to support the doctrine of the Trinity. Oh. That's a stretch. I've heard of that. Well, yeah. <laughs> hang on, hang on. I've heard of that. <laughs> it says, they brought this as a proof, that God is three, because it says, Lord, <laughs> our God, God. God. They use this verse to support the concept of a trinity. <laughs> the okay. Hasidus asks a question. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Echad means one. Yochid means an individual. The proper term would be Yochid, not Echad. And, and Kabbalah wants to ask why the word Echad is used in Torah. And it comes to say, it doesn't mean there's one God. That's not what we're talking about. It means there isn't anything else except God. I have a question. There is no other existence but God. That's why it doesn't say Yachid, it says Echad. We're not going to get into the Kabbalistic discussion tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be a class on that. But the ambiguity that's left, Dave, don't take us too far off track. It's already 7.53. No, I'm not taking, okay. I'm, I'm not taking you on another train. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I, I would think that this statement would be related to Yaakov's question when he asked God, what is your name? And God when he goes, asked the angel of, when he asked the angel of Asa. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. And I am. Right. So the, the singular of, the, of God, the presence, I am. Yeah, there, and, and we have multiple proofs that it's one God and God is the only entity, et cetera. But, but in the context here, we're showing again this, this piece of ambiguity. Stan. I would also like to comment without taking you off track very briefly. I've had this question for about 50 years, and that's the first explanation that met, met my question. My question simply was, coming from a naive perspective, the word one, the Lord is one. Is that an adjective or a nom predicate nominative, a noun? <laughs> if it could be that the Lord is oneness, and that was the explanation that you mm -hmm. just explained that everything is God. First mm -hmm. time I've heard anybody explain it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why well, I, mean, I was wondering if that was a pretty good that. nominative oneness. Yes, <clears throat> and, and that's derived from the fact that the word echad is used, not yachid. It comes to the Hebrew grammar that says, no, it, it is the only entity. It changes everything when you think of it that way. Yes, mm. absolutely. 
Absolutely. Okay, so we've said that there's one, one advantage of, of having an oral law is to avoid ambiguity, to be able to go into much, much greater detail than you could in a, just a written text. So that, that's part of it. Let's go to the next piece. If you have to learn something, let's, let's and I, again, I'm watching our time here. <clears throat> By the way, for those who are new, I never end on time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but we try. We try. <laughs> um, so here, text number 13. One of the things that Yeshua Fall Kakayim Katz brings up in his Sefer is that back in Moses' time, if you can't write it down, that means you have to memorize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means you have to work a lot harder. Mm -hmm. a lot longer to draw this into concrete memory. It's going to take more effort. And the fact that it requires more time learning means you have to understand it better to get there. I, I, um, there's, a, there's a veteran that was, um, he was, he was training for special ops. And in this training, they would um, every week they would give a new a new logic puzzle that your team had to figure out. <laughs> and by and large, it would take the bulk of the week to figure out the the, the logic puzzle, right? Um, but it happened to be that that Maishi had a yeshiva background, <laughs> and he figured out these puzzles with usually within a couple of hours and and it was so off track so off norm that they literally accused him of cheating they <laughs> couldn't figure out how could you be cheating did you read every every book every joke book in the in like how how, how? but they literally accused him of cheating and Moshe was like incensed like what do you what how, how can you even <laughs> he explain to them I went to yeshiva. I learned Gemara for six years. <laughs> I learned the concepts of logic and how logic is learned out, the functions and the formats. You're asking a logical puzzle. Why can't it shouldn't be figured out in a couple hours? <laughs> <laughs> so when someone spends that amount of time sitting and trying to learn something by memory, by heart, trying to really understand it, it has to make a lot more sense to be able to understand. When you, when you memorize something, you have to really get it to memorize it correctly. It has to make sense to you. Let's look at text number 14. There's another advantage of the amount of work that goes into learning what this Torah means. And that is the fact that when you learn God's Torah, you are learning God's will. This is God's wisdom and rutzen, his desire, his will. If in such and such a case, so-and-so says this and so-and-so says this and the outcome is this, the logic that's involved there, this is divine wisdom. And when, and, and, and the Hasidus, the al Rebbe talks about this in, in Tanya, if, if you focus on an idea, your mind is grasping that idea while actually being consumed by that idea what kind of unity like that exists in any format in the world? Mm -hmm. When your mind grasps an idea and is consumed by that idea, there's no greater unity in the world. Mm. And so just trying to grasp a Torah idea, which we're doing tonight, mm -hmm. to wrap your head around it, mm. is a divine connection with God. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the logical process and the learning. It's about the connection with God. Okay. So if you have to study something, it's a superior learning and not just superior in intellectual, but in, in, in spirit as well. There's a superior, okay. superiority mm -hmm. of having to really work on something to learn it and grasp it. Mm -hmm. Number three, if you're going to learn <coughs> some written text, <laughs> Like what we've been doing, we're taking pieces of text and trying to understand concepts based on the written text that we're playing with here. 
you go find a teacher. You go find a mentor. And you find a mentor who's a living example, a living model of what it is you're trying to study. And in doing so, you now have a direct connection, a living connection of what you're studying from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, all the way back to Moses and his conversations with God on Mount Sinai for three sets of 40 days and 40 nights. It's a living connection. Now, you might want to say, <clears throat> hey, we played the broken telephone game when we were kids. We all did that, right? So how do we know that this is not just a broken telephone, right? So let's look at text number 15, 15 alpha, right? What was the, 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 how was this passed on, right? Moses learned this directly from the Al Almighty on Mount Sinai. Then he came down from the mountain and Aaron would enter Moses's tent and Moses would teach Aaron. Then Aaron would sit next to him and in would come Aaron's sons. And Moses would teach it again to Aaron's sons while Aaron is listening. And then Aaron's sons move off to the other side of Moses, and Elazar would come in, and he would learn, and it would be repeated. But each time it's being repeated, the others are there listening to it being repeated again. So that the longer you sat through the class, the repetition of the class, the more you heard it, and the more you heard it repeated with more explanations involved in it. <laughs> And so it became cemented in. Sounds like the army method. First you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. And that's, that is a tried and true method of communication. So there's no possible way that this is a broken telephone because you've seen this being communicated through multiple channels, multiple times, and they still have the, we still have the, all of these pieces together. Page 22. Let's look at 15. Let's go to page 23. 15, Charlie. After 40 years in the desert, on the first of Shabbat, Moses gathered the people and he said, the day of my death is near. Therefore, whoever has heard from me something but forgot it or needs a clarification, come and ask. So they've learned this for 40 years in the desert. Before he passes away, Moses says, is anything unclear? Come and talk about it. Now, there's a learning exercise here we don't have time for, but you can kind of play it, look at it on your own. But basically, if I had a sentence I wanted you to memorize that says, the shy green lion had too much to drink and fell out of the window, if you had a mnemonic to look at, the initials to look at, it would be easier to memorize. Now, I don't have to explain this to you because you all have some military background and you know we do acronyms all the time. If you have an acronym, it's a shortened version of what it is you have to know and it helps us to, 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 to have a shorter, briefer conversation, but we're all on the same page as long as we all understand the same acronyms. <laughs> That's my singular weakness. I have the trouble with ac acronyms to this day because in Germany, we take a lot of stuff and shove them together into one big humongous word. You guys do the opposite and I have trouble with that. <laughs> if you can remember what the mnemonic means. Exactly. So this again, the idea is that the written Torah is the foundation for all of the oral Torah that will come. It was at the time we're talking about in Moses' era, it's still totally oral. Mm -hmm. Now, in the conclusion, there, what happens is that over time, I mean, hang up, let's back up a second. We've all been on around the campfire. And sometimes we're in a campfire in a colder location than others. Mm -hmm. The farther you move away from the, the campfire, the colder it gets. The farther away we are from Mount Sinai, the less we understand it. As the generations went past, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the, 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 the 
prince of the generation, the tzaddik of his time, realized that the oral tradition wasn't going to suffice much longer. The exile was, cost, was too much of a greater cost and we were losing it. And so he went around and he collected all of the oral discussions about what the written Torah means. And he collected it into a written format called the Mishnah. And what is the Mishnah? The Mishnah says, this rabbi said this. And this <laughs> rabbi said this. And this rabbi says, well, this is what that means. And that's what the Mishnah is. When we pick up next week, we want to take off from that, that, that place. That the time from Moses to up to Rabbi Yehud Hanasi, all of the oral Torah was studied with great diligence, repeated again and again, <coughs> memorized, understood. It forced us, because there were no vowels, there were no punctuations, it forced us to really look at it and get a really solid grasping of it so it would make total sense to us as it had to those who originally learned it. Once we start to lose it, now what happens? We're going to start discussing that next week. <laughs> and over the next few weeks, we will cover all the different details of it. Um, at the conclusion of our class, I'm going to ask for some input. I'm going to turn off the recording, and I'm going to give you some notes about the upcoming weeks. I always like to ask, what do you walk away with from tonight's discussion? What was new or exciting or interesting that you came off of tonight that, that made it worthwhile for attending the last hour and a half? <laughs> for Stan, it was Shema Yisrael Echad. I got that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me add to that, though, because, and I'll be brief, when I look at the key points on page 24, I come away with something quite different. Not that this oral tradition helps ensure the integrity and accuracy, but that the oral tradition seems to have added ambiguity and diversity. And I think maybe, and I say maybe, I don't know, I'm exploring this, that the real strength is not that there is a single code to which everyone adheres, but that there's a tradition of diversity to which everyone grapples and struggles with. And it's the struggle that gives us the strength, not the single code, I think. You're on lesson three. Stop that. <laughs> okay. I'm, I, that's where I'm going. Very good. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> what else do you walk away with? I think the fact that you're, pointed, that you're pointing out that or reminding us that the Torah has no punctuation, no vowels and requires explanation or learning in order to have it make sense. Uh, I think that that, if nothing else, to me, that was valuable. Excellent. In, in my pea brain, I can sort of summarize it like the Torah is the gizmo and the oral Torah is the user manual. <laughs> Very good. It's interesting. And there's, there's going to be it's more to that, though. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. The collection of the oral traditions is the Mishnah. Mm -hmm. We'll break it down. It, if it were, if it were a uniform learning, as you said, yeah, learned four times, so there'd be no mistake. Yeah. Why? then would one rabbi say one thing and another rabbi say something else? The Jews. The yes. Jews have uh, opinions. Yes. That's fair point. That's and, it. And, and, In and which gonna... case, how reliable is this oral Torah? Yes. Excellent. And we're going to get into that. We're going to dive into that. And part of that comes to part of that comes to our perspectives on things. We talked about Hillel and Shammai, right? Mm -hmm. Hillel Shammai is a, is is his his mida his temperament is very restrictive, very guarded, very controlling, and that can be a really good thing, especially if you're trying to do something dangerous and put someone on the moon or something, right? 
You want to know that you factored in every yeah. potential problem. Right? Perfectionist. Yes. And Hillel, his personality is much broader. His personality is much more open to, well, we could consider that as a way of doing it. We could, you know, that's, it. that's worth looking at. That potentially could fit into this model. When we light the Hanukkah menorah, Hillel, Shammai was saying, we have eight days, light eight candles. There's seven days left, light only seven candles. Only six days left, only light six candles. Yeah. Hillel said, we've got one day, light it up. This is the second day. Now we find us, we're adding to that light. The third day, there's more light. It's both true. Yeah. But they're looking at it from different yeah. perspectives within the human psyche and emotion. And it goes right back to what Stan was saying. The diversity that is implemented into our learning capacity yeah. is built into the system. And yeah. that's why, that's one of the reasons we have to have an oral law. Because, yes, it's one law for all of us, but we're going to see it in different ways. Yeah. Well, there's even something that confuses me about the when we do Shimon Esther, you moderni, we thank God for everything. There are like two, two uh, changes when I when repetition of the Shimon Esther. There's another version. I, I think we say one version at the beginning, then when the Chazan repeats, I think he says the first version. We say the second. I can't. I don't know how that works. All I know is there's some difference. It doesn't seem that all that different to me. But I guess there's a discrepancy, an argument about which one you do. So we do both. Is that is that where, where that came from? There, there is a there is a concept to that as well. There is a concept yeah. as well. And I'll wrap is it up here, which, and we'll yeah, okay. welcome everyone back again next week. Okay.